Mixing strings and orchestral elements in ambient music requires a different touch compared to traditional classical music or pop. Depending on the emotion and feel you want the mix to impart, you can use EQ, tape and compression to sculpt the perfect sound. In this video, I walk through a recent mix and talk through my plugin choices and reasoning behind the way I mixed real strings in a sparse and beautiful piano and string composition. Recently, I created a video for the Produce Like a Pro channel about mixing modern classical music and I was thrilled to read the comments to find out that I'd newly introduced people to the genre and they were loving it. And they enjoyed the fact that the tutorial was not focused on rock. So when one of my neoclassical clients reached out and asked how I'd achieved such a warm and wide string mix, I thought I'd capture it for YouTube as well. So let's jump into it. So what I've got for you today is a bit different to what I normally do here on the channel, but I was asked a question on email by a client and I thought it'd make actually a really great video for you guys. So this is it. And it's all about strings. So a little bit different to the norm. And uh, the client is uh, Anna Sara Lundgren. And I had the great pleasure of mixing one of her compositions as part of a Reworks album. If you want to know more about that, I'll put links in the description below because I've done some other videos on those types of uh, mixers over on the Produce Like a Pro channel. So anyway, I'll put all the links to those down below. For today though, I want to go through Anna Sara's email and just answer her questions. Um, and hopefully those answers will help you too. So her email says that the song in question is uh, called A Lifetime Rolls By. And uh, it's an instrumental, there are no vocals, so I shouldn't call it a song. <laughs> but it is quite a sparse instrumental. And let me just show you the session because it is really quite small. It's a main piano and then it's a piano riff. And then it's a series of violins. And the reason for that is because Anasara violins are her instrument. They're how she makes music, she has that it's how she puts music out into the world. And uh, it's all for this modern classical genre of music that is very kind of cinematic in style if you haven't heard it before. It's typical of what you might hear on a movie or a TV programme or documentary. But it's very it's beautiful music, very emotive, and I love mixing it. So this session here comprises mostly of strings. And Anasara had sent a rough mix to me and her response to that, to my mix, was that she was, uh, she loved the sound of it, in particular the warmth and depth to the strings and width. And what she says is, and what she asks, if I refer to the email, she asks what I did in the mixing process to get that sound. Did you add and cut a lot of EQ and how was it so big and wonderful? You received my files with all of my preferred reverbs and delays, but it sounded bigger than in my Logic project. I'm just curious because sometimes I have a hard time explaining to my mix engineer to get the results that I want from the violin. And she, of course, wants to learn for herself. So I thought that'd be great for me to go over on a video rather than trying to do it all on an email answer to her. And you guys get to see that as well. So the first thing then, uh, I guess, is that everything goes through various buses in my template. So if I start at the bottom, my mixes all start from the top. So I have all the tracks and they go through buses or collection points here, like auxiliaries. So there is a keys aux, which is for the, all the piano tracks, all two stereo tracks of them went through. And then all the violins which are all stereo, but only purely just to keep the uh, the panning that the producer wanted um, built into the uh, to the record. So I kept all the panning as was sent to me. So that's why they're all stereo tracks. All the strings go through a string aux. 
okay? And then I process them as one thing. Um, and then, of course, all all the auxes go through another gathering point. Um, this is just because of how my session, my uh, mixed template is set up. So I just kind of keep it. There's no need to have these final two auxiliaries here or groups here, but I just keep them because I'm used to seeing them. And it's a final place for me to do any little tweaks post processing on the auxiliaries. OK, so those two final auxiliaries go through my mix bus and the mix bus is where some of the sound is happening. Uh, we're talking about the sound being big and wonderful and wide um, and warm, I think. So if we start at the end, at the mix bus, because these will all have been on and I would have mixed through them. Some of the settings in here I would have changed as the mix uh, got going. Some of them will add level, so that's intentional. I wanted to increase the level of the mixed tracks. And I like to do it in lots of little places rather than all in one place, like a, a limiter, for example. If, if I bypass those, there will be a level drop and that can make it difficult to assess the A and B. But that's what that's how it is in the session. So that's what it is. The very last plugin is just a limiter by PSP Audio a company that I rate highly. If you haven't checked out their plugins, then do because they've got some marvellous plugins and, and I use several of them. I've been using the PSP Xenon now for probably the last four, four years or so. And I like it because it's quite neutral sounding. It doesn't have to be, but I use it so that it is. And so all that's doing, I've got it set on limiter gentle and it's set to minus 0.5 dBs, so half a dB there where I am just catching the peaks. I just don't want to see any red lights uh, at the master fader. So that's what that's there for, just a peak stop limiter. Uh, then you will have seen this. I've covered this before on my Mixbus plugin video again over on the Produce Like a Pro channel. You can see that. Um, I'll pop a card for that up top. This is some sort of, it's a, like a, almost like tape saturation. I have it set to 100% effect, which might seem pretty drastic, but it's what, I, it's what I've been doing for quite some time now. I've got the curve set to 27. Now you see these arrows here, that is like the unity gain or the zero point where nothing is happening. Nothing, the curve, EQ curve, isn't changing any. But at the moment I'm using 27 and that is kind of biased a bit more towards the warmer side. I've pulled the output down by two and a half dBs, which is probably a, a little bit, a slight attempt actually to level match this. So let's have a go and see what it, whether it does actually make any difference. I, um, I haven't played any of the track to you yet, so it's very, very gentle, laid back, obviously lots of strings and piano. Let's just play this through and then I'll bypass the Oxford inflator. Okay, I can hear the warmth really coming in on the lower notes of the piano. It is still bumping up the level a little bit, um, so don't let that fool you. There is a little bit of uh, warmth uh, coming through from this plugin, and a little tiny little bit of width as well. I guess what I should do really is play you before I go any further. Play you Anasara's uh, rough mix. The rough mix here is where she feels as though my mix is uh, wider and more fuller sounding. So let's have a listen. This will go from the same point in the track. So uh, I'll start with my mix and then I'll switch the big A, B button over so it goes to orange and that will be Anasara's. <laughs>
so hopefully that's giving you an idea um, between the two mixers and uh, why Anasara was so interested in how I'd achieved the sounds in my mix. When I heard Anasara's mix, I just felt as though it was a little bit pointy and the strings in particular were a little nasal and had in the mid section, it was it was just a little bit too forward and a um, tiny bit harsh. So I wanted to pull that back and make it just sound rounder and fuller. OK, so back to these Mixbus plugins. So a little bit of warmth is coming from this. And then uh, next back is this ML4000 multiband limiter. Let's show you the crossovers. There are one, two, three, four bands. And the first crossover is at 74 hertz. The second is at 735 hertz. And the third is at 8000 hertz. And that's just doing some mul gentle multiband compression just to kind of level level things out. I'll do a bypass on that one for you. Might be a, not so much of a level jump on this. Okay, that I felt as though I was just controlling the piano, keeping the low end of the piano in check and clearing up a little bit around mainly that seven, 700 hertz area. Just pulling that down a little bit, compressing that a little bit uh, to clean up everything either side of it. Next back is this Better Maker EQ. I'm not actually applying any EQ with this. It's just switched in. Okay because it has got a character of its own. And the only thing that I've got switched in, because you can actually switch in all sorts of just the different EQ um, points for it, but I've got this PEQ in, and that is a Pultec. That's the Pultec sound. But the benefit of doing it through this Better Maker plugin is that this is cleaner sounding. The Pultecs are usually emulations, direct emulations of the real thing. And this is a cleaner version. It's um, not got quite the, the noise around it as the original hardware units do. Let's take a listen and see what this is doing. This might be very subtle. OK, that is adding that's adding width to me. I can hear the strings are appearing on the side on the sides of the stereo field by just by switching this in. And I've got one or two things uh, switched differently to the default, n namely just the, like this slope here of the EQ settings. And maybe the EQ points are different, but but I'm not adding any gain or taking away any gain at those points. Um, it's just, like I said, it's just switched in. And I can hear that in the width. Let me move a little bit further along the uh, performance. I'll try it again. I'll start with it bypass and then I'll bring it in. <laughs> OK, uh, if you can hear on the very edges, there is a string track that just seems to become a little bit brighter and a little bit wider. OK, you can rewind that and listen again. OK, so I'm going to leave that back in. Then we get to a tape machine. This is probably doing quite a lot. This is the classic emulation of the Ampex ATR 102, which is a mastering tape machine. Uh, 
I have chosen in this particular mix to use the 456 tape type, the plus six calibration and the half inch tape head. And quite, if I've changed anything else, it would have been to switch the noise off. But everything else is, is set. The auto calibration is on. So this is probably how it defaulted. And I just chose the different tape settings here to what I thought felt better for the for the performance for the material. It's on 15 ips, 15 inches per second. Uh, as I say, I think this is probably doing quite a lot to cleaning up the sound and adding a bit of width. I'll start with it in and then I'll bypass it. just sounds flat to me without it this makes it sound like a record to me cleans all the stuff that's happening in the low mids just tightens up and the strings sound more bedded into the track like I say it just sounds more like a record and then I have a couple of compressors uh, in series the second of which is his fair child. You probably won't hear anything happening on this, but it's great for adding a little bit of warmth. What what's happening is that I'm all these kind of tonal characteristics are all mounting up, and I've said this before in other videos, but it all happens, it's a little bit happening in several places, and it all mounts up and layers on top of one another to what I think gives a more natural sounding result. So whilst you AB these things individually, they don't necessarily give you the full picture sometimes. So I'll start with this in and then I'll bypass it. Okay, for me, that is when you listen to that main violin line, the main melody line, that is uh, taking away some of that harshness and smoothing out tonally the sound of that violin. Okay, so it's just mellowing it out and softening the harder edges. The very first compressor I've got in on my mix bus is this 33 609 by Neve. Neve renowned for adding warmth. So that's uh, obviously going to be a characteristic of this when I bypass it for you. I'm not compressing an awful lot, only 1.5 to 1 ratio. This is adding a little bit again because I think it actually adds a little bit more character that way, not just level. I could be wrong, but uh, that's the impression I have. With 100 millisecond recovery and very, the threshold is really high, so there's hardly anything going to be going over it. And the limiter isn't being used. Let's bypass this and see what it sounds like. I'll start with in and then I'll bypass it. Yeah, that's adding width for me and um, warmth out on the sides. So I think that's working really well on doing quite a lot towards the sound, both this and the ATR 102. So that is the mix bus. Then going back upstream, one more step. I've got these all buses, so they're all keys and all strings. OK, so these are all the gathering points post processing of the buses further up. All that I'm happening is happening here 
is a simple EQ just to take off 21 Hertz and underneath just to give me more headroom and to help the uh, mix bus compressors work a little bit more efficiently. Same with exactly the same on the keys bus. And then the other thing that's the same on the two all groups are this BX uh, digital from Brainworks. This is a plugin I use on probably nearly nearly every mix. And what I'm using this for in this instance is to stereo width. You were asking me about width and this is one of the places where I add it, artificial width. Obviously we're getting it from some of the Mixbus plugins as well, uh, but this is where I'm actually using a stereo width plugin to 124% for some reason. And then none of the EQs are switched in. The only other thing I'm doing is a mono maker here. I think, I can't remember exactly now, this may have been going to vinyl. So I just took away or monoed up, I should say, everything under 68 hertz just for vinyl. Uh, let's A, B this then, shall we? Just listen to the strings and hear how they uh, get a little bit wider. I'll start with it in and then I'll bypass it. Just, just great natural sounding width added to the strings. When I bypass it, they just sound just a little bit more central, as you would expect. Okay. Uh, not that we're really talking about the, the keyboards here today. Yeah, uh, I'm not even doing it on the keyboards. You see, this was because this was all about the violins, really, because that's what Anasara does. So that is what I felt needed the more kind of fairy dust embellishment. And so I kept the pianos as they came to me. Uh, stereo, obviously, but no artificial panning or width added. This all goes towards the, how big the violins sound because there's context against a narrower sounding piano. If, they, if everything's wide, then nothing sounds wide. All right. Okay, uh, yeah, just 50 hertz mono maker there, uh, thinking about that vinyl release. Now we can go further back up the chain and get to the strings themselves. We'll look at this string auxiliary, I think, here. All that's happening is a little bit of EQ, another uh, Fairchild, old school, warm, lush compressor of the back in from back in the 60s maybe be before. Then a Deessa, which is kind of my trick, I think. Not my trick, but a trick that I use when mixing strings. And then another tape machine. So let's go back through these in reverse order. Let's look at this tape machine. Not much. I think I may have just changed the tape type here. But let's uh, play and I'll keep it in and then I'll bypass it. In all honesty, I can't hear that doing very much at all. If anything, it's just going towards that, uh, smoothing out the top end of the strings a little bit, just taking the harshness off a tiny bit. But really, uh, I can't really hear it, hear it doing too much. This always sits on my string bus. Sometimes it, it has a bigger effect than other times. But in this case, it, it didn't really have that much of an effect when you send more string information to it, if it were a fuller arrangement, um, then you'd perhaps hear its effect a little bit more obviously. 
back up the chain. This is kind of what is the main tool that's helping me with the harshness or pointedness of the strings. If I, if I do the, go back to uh, Anasara's mix here, and if you listen to the strings, they just have a an edge to them. Okay, can you hear that? It's um, you can almost hear the bow on the strings, really. It's that I can't, edginess is the only way I can describe it, really. I could say harshness, I suppose. But that's why I use this DSO. And what it does is it, it centers in on that sort of 2K region. That's where I've got this one dialed into at the moment. And that really does make the strings sound a little bit more realistic. These are real strings, however. Um, not uh, any samples. This is Anasara's playing, her performance. And so I'm just wanting to mellow them out a little bit more. So uh, let's go back to my mix on the blue. Let's run through this section. I'll start with this in and then I'll bypass it. So that kind of it jumps out quite a bit, doesn't it? it? Makes them obviously makes the strings sound a lot louder because it's all of a sudden we've got this um, presence into in the two K range, which is right uh, where you know babies cry and things like that. So yeah, it's going to sound a lot louder to us. But what it's doing in removing it is just smoothing out the tonal balance. Uh, let me play it again for you. Okay, so it is doing quite a lot. So this is probably the main thing that's making it sound fuller and warmer, coupled with everything else, then adding in tiny increments afterwards. And then what what I did was when I'm do, using this, I just tease it in to the mix using the threshold here to a point where it feels about right, sounds about right against the piano. I always use it at 2K as well, unless it's not working, but it usually does. If the string's playing a higher register, then I might just move that up a little bit more to two and a half, 3K and play with it. Female DS Narrow is the preset and it's attenuating anywhere between four and six, uh, sorry, four and 10 dBs gain reduction at 2K. That's my reasoning for putting that there it's doing an awful lot to making them sound a little bit smoother, rounder, fuller, and to sit in with the, uh, the softer sounding piano. Then back up, uh, up one to the another Fairchild. This is a preset called Slow Strings. Again, it always sits on the string bus and the more level going through it, the more string layers going through it, the more it actually does something to the sound. So I'm not sure what you'll hear this time. There is a bumping output here, 5 dBs, so it will get louder. Um, got quieter obviously because I started it in and then bypassed it um, but yeah I always mix through it it's difficult to tell whether it's actually doing anything to the tone because of that level bump but it's just always there and then I have a low cut filter at 45 hertz 
just to catch any low end rumbling, particularly because these are real strings recorded with a microphone in a room and played by a real person, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, all the foibles of that room that could be coming down the microphone and into the recording. So 45 hertz, just to get rid of any low stuff going on. And then we get back to the, we get up to track level then. Not an awful lot going on here. I've used a trim plug in here just by uh, just adding a dB because of my funny little quirk of not wanting to take the the volume past unity. It's just something I do. And it, seeing a trim plug in there, automatically I can see, oh, I've had to bump this track up a little bit. So if the producer comes back to me and says, oh, violin two is a bit quiet, then I know why. Or then I know that I've done something to it anyway with regards to volume and I can I can go to it straight away and I know exactly what I've done. I wouldn't be so wise if these faders were all over the place, you see. But because they're all sitting at zero, I know that that's where I started off at. Rest of things going on, the arpeggio group, uh, I must have felt was getting a little bit too scratchy up there. So at 3K, I've pulled down um, with a shelf by uh, 3 dBs or so, and then added in um, 33 hertz cut at the bottom. Uh, let's solo that, see if you can hear what that's doing. Yeah, I just want to keep those because uh, they're on the edges there and we're doing a lot with width, or a reasonable amount with artificial width. Just wanted to keep them under control, just make them sound less obvious in the sides. I wanted it all to sound smooth and and coherent. And probably I've done the same. Yeah, it's just a straight copy over onto the other arpeggio. So arpeggio one and two. I didn't want them to take away from the string blend at that point. Okay, just want to tuck them in a bit and I did that with this high shelf. And then what else am I doing? I am using S1 Imager here, so what do they sound like. So they're very otherworldly, and these are the delays and reverbs that Anasara was talking about in her email that were already built into the sound, yet I've made them sound larger than her logic project. And it's, it will be because of this, the S1 Imager. If I bypass it, I'll play it again and then I'll bring it in. Yeah, nice. Spreads it out wide to the sides, to the up to the ends, the opposite sides, the outer edges of the arpeggios we just heard as well. Let's actually solo, if I solo those strings and then bypass this harmonic S1 imager and see if we can detect it in the string mix. just nicely pops it on the edges of the string mix. All that I'm left with then uh, is another couple of EQs. Uh, that EQ, very similar, that's at 3.5k and 84 hertz on this violin one, which is obviously playing a main part of the string mix. Yeah, 
um, same reason it's there as it was for the arpeggios. It's just keeping the the higher frequencies just uh, dumbed down a little bit so that it all sounds like a lovely kind of wash of strings. The violin pad then has got this arrangement to it where I'm pulling out in this 1K to 2K area again that uh, sort of nasal pointy area. So, so let's have a listen to this bypassed and then I'll bring the EQ in. So it's that nasalness, it's just tucking it in. So I just wanted to keep that nasalness under control. Okay, and then here. So that's 2K and 1K, where I usually go to with strings just to uh, stop them from poking out the mix and just just has them sitting nicely with other, particularly with other instrumentation. So that's it really. All that's left is the pianos, but I'm not really talking about the, the pianos in this uh, video, but I am using a width plugin on this piano riff, again, just to help spread the two piano tracks apart from each other. That's using this great uh, Nugent plugin called Stereoizer, which I do use a lot for stereo width manipulation. Um, I'll play the piano, let's do it soloed. I'll play the piano and then bypass it. Whenever I hear a piano playing a tinkly pit part like that, I always just naturally just want to put it out really wide so that it's that fairy dust that I'm talking about on the edges. And this plugin works brilliantly for that. Similar EQs, but this is at 4.2K to keep the highs under control. And then the very main the main piano again is just pulling out a little bit at 695 just to tidy it up. If you remember way down at the mix bus on the ML4000, that's got a band set at about 735, 735 hertz, which is doing a little bit of gentle compression as well in that area. So it just helps to keep the, the mid range and the, just sound a little bit cleaner and tighter. I guess I could bypass that for you just to highlight that. Okay, just cleans it up a little bit and 60 hertz low cut filter still sounded lovely and warm but I just wanted to make sure it wasn't going to get too rumbly okay so that's it a uh, quickish run through on the session hope that's helped a little bit in pinpointing where I was able to make the strings sound wider and fuller and so hopefully that's going to help you mix strings in your next composition. This mix needed to be big, round, rich and warm, resulting in the decisions I made in the walkthrough regarding the toning down of the high end of the strings. For a more traditional classical sound, you wouldn't do this. And it's more about keeping the recording as true and natural sounding as possible. 
I really enjoy mixing this style of music because there's nowhere to hide. There are no vocals to push front and centre. It's all about the instruments and making them fit together to create a rich soundscape that's full of movement and emotion. If you want to go deeper with me on a full mix featuring orchestral elements, pianos and drums, then check out this video on screen now or check out this one find out how you can keep your perspective when mixing your own music. That's all from me and I'll see you in the next video.